Hey, Critical Thinkers, welcome to this episode of the Healthy and Wake podcast, where I have a very cool guest today. He's the author of Brutal Minds, the Dark World of Left-Wing Brainwashing in Our Universities. His name is Dr. Stanley Ridgely. Now, first, let me say I'm not exactly political publicly. This isn't a political show, but as you probably know, I do talk a lot about propaganda, influence, manipulation how it's constantly ongoing, and how we need to protect ourselves from that. So whether you're against left-wing or right-wing uh, ideologies or, or any of that, I've, I'll talk to anybody. If somebody wants to talk to me about right-wing brainwashing, let's do it. Um, but nonetheless, you know, whatever side we're talking about, it's still important to pay attention to these things with an open mind and scrutinize it, especially if we maybe identify, right? I'm, I'm not uh, against anyone here. I'm not trying to judge or attack anyone here. If, even if somebody identifies themselves as left wing, I would invite you to listen to this conversation with an open mind um, because you know, can, there's definitely some benefit to exploring things that maybe we haven't examined in some time. So uh, I think there's, even beyond that, I think there's a lot of value, a lot of really interesting things mentioned in this episode. Dr. Ridgely is a really cool guy. I have here a list of some of his credentials. I'm going to read them off. So first, Brew Minds is a book that explores the ways in which left-wing ideology has infiltrated and influenced higher education in the United States. Dr. Ridgely is a professor and scholar who has taught at various universities and has taught at Temple and Drexel, as well as China, India, Russia, Colombia, Singapore, and Spain. He has written extensively on topics related to education, politics, and culture. He has also authored Strategic Thinking Skills for the Great Courses, which is a very big, uh, awesome company if you like learning. And of course, critical thinking is what we're all about here. He, further, he has been interviewed by various media outlets about his book and his views on education and politics. He is a former military intelligence officer and Russian linguist for the United States Army. And he holds the world record for juggling the most chainsaws at once. Okay, I made the last one up, but the rest of them are all true. Um, I just added, I mean, there's so many cool things on this list. So if you're listening to this episode, uh, the day that it goes out or even the week that it goes out, I'm doing a promotion on my LinkedIn because LinkedIn seems to be actually the most active social media platform for me, funny enough. Uh, but on LinkedIn, I will be posting this episode there where you can share it for the chance to win a free signed copy of the book. And it's really a, a great book. So please check that out. You can always go to MikeVira.com to find my social media handles and all that at the bottom of the page. You can also go to BrutalMinds.com if you want to read more about Dr. Ridgely and his book. Of course, you can buy it anywhere books are sold. And without further ado, let's get into it. So I'm here with Dr. Stanley Ridgely, and I just started reading his new book, Brutal Minds. The Dark World of Left-Wing Brainwashing in Our Universities. Now, I'm not necessarily a very political person. Uh, this isn't exactly a political show, but we do talk a lot about propaganda and uh, ideologies and persuasion and influence. Uh, so I was immediately attracted to your book. This is a story of one of the great subterfuges in American history. It's a tale of how one of history's great institutions, the American University, is undergoing an infiltration by an army of mediocrities whose goal it is to destroy an institution of knowledge creation and replace it with an authoritarian organ of ideology and propaganda. My favorite word, propaganda. So, uh, doctor, can you help me understand? why this might be important to the listeners of this show. Well, if you believe that the institutions of America that educate the, the subs, you know, the generations to come um, uh, in the civics, the basic civics lessons, the basic lessons of government, how we engage with each other, how we govern ourselves, 
if you believe that's important, well, then the, then the uh, raison d'etre of my book, the importance of the book should be pretty clear. If we indeed believe that our institutions are important, uh, you know, religious institutions, educational institutions, governmental institutions, uh, and that they serve as the bedrock um, of the freedoms that we enjoy, the hard-won freedoms that we enjoy, then any, um, any intentional systemic attack or assault on those institutions should concern all of us. And that's what uh, Brutal Minds is about. There is indeed a systemic, planned, purposeful, intentional assault on this particular institution. Now, perhaps there are other institutions that are under assault as well. I can't speak to those, but I can speak to the uh, institution of higher education uh, very succinctly, very deeply. And it worries me. It troubles me that this uh, a sustained assault has been going on for at least 20 years. Some would say a lot longer, but I'm concerned primarily with the last 20 years. And I think that this is the actual what is new uh, that is offered by Brutal Minds. It's not a recapitulation of what we all think and know to be true. And that's one of the hardest, most frustrating things I've had to uh, confront it with respect to this book is that uh, most folks will say, who are not good, good thinking folks, smart folks will say, oh yes, 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 I know all about that. I know all about the indoctrination. I know all about the brainwashing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, no, you don't. No, you don't. You know that there's something going on and you kind of know who the villains are. You kind of know who the good guys are, sort of. But this book really lays it out there and says it offers some very surprising revelations that the enemy is not who you think it, who you think they are. Um, you know, folks have myself, my counterparts on the left in, in the faculty. Um, these folks, the uh, Gadfly faculty, the Twitter celebrities, the folks who say outrageous things, the folks who wear the, the berets or the backward newsboy caps and wearing the leather vests and, you know, waving a copy of uh, the Capitol, a Das Kapital. That's all well and good, but those, those are kinds of uh, uh, gadfly folks that uh, we all kind of make fun of and we tolerate. They're unusual personalities. Those aren't the villains. Now, they, they are fellow travelers with the villains, but the real villains on campus use the faculty as a shield to mask their own activities. And that is what is uh, utterly new in, in Brutal Minds. And once that facade of who is actually doing it you know, is torn away and is revealed, the ugly viscera of the, of the university, uh, then we can begin to take those important steps to regain and recapture this institution that is so important to America's, America's future. I will uh, add finally to that, that this assault on the institutions that we hold dear was formulated by um, a, a neo-Marxist uh, of the critical theory school named, uh, by the name of Herbert Marcuse. Uh, back in 1968, he was the one of the three M's of the of the world's left, that was Marx, Marcuse, and Mao and Mao Zedong. Uh, in 1972, in a book called uh, Revolution and Counter Revolution, um, he laid out. He kind of cribbed from, from someone else. He said, uh, "We're engaged in a long march through the institutions," which meant that he was going to his leftist comrades were going to undermine the institutions that made America what it is today, uh, the democratic Western tradition, the Continental Enlightenment and burrow within and destroy those institutions and transform them into something more akin to his liking, more akin to the liking of this alien ideology of, of neo-Marxism. And so that essentially is what Brutal Minds is all about and why we should care about what is happening on America's campuses. So I actually know a few people who are self-proclaimed Marxists or self-proclaimed leftists. So how or why exactly would you say that this is undermining a lot of the American values that we hold here in this country? Well, I know some Marxists, too. I mean, I knew one of who was the uh, head of uh, Temple's University Press years ago. He moved over to another university. I won't I won't uh, say which university it is, uh, but he was a very uh, committed Marxist. Uh, recognized the realities of capitalism that he had to earn a living, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. Um, I'm going to pay lip service to, to, uh, to Marx, but while I'm earning a good living here in the, in the, uh, in the America, yeah, enjoying that American way, way of life. That's kind of typical of, of, of these folks. Um, so the idea that there are committed Marxists among us, this is not an untruth. There are committed Marxists. They usually enjoy the perquisites of life that is a 20, 25 levels above life at 
as we know it on the streets of, of the United States. They're insulated from the implications and the results of their own policies, much like the, the old Communist Party nomenclatura, nomenclatura of the old Soviet Union, insulated from the uh, policies that the uh, Soviet dictatorship was Im you know, imposing on, on the people, this forced equality that, um, that the nomenclatura, the elites of the Soviet Union, really never had to, never had to engage in, never had to experience themselves. Uh, and so that is one of the problems that the folks who are committed Marxists, uh, probably people you know, people you like, you know, you can have those wonderful conversations uh, with them who are but yet committed to undermining institutions that, that make America, that ironically provide them with the platform to do and say what they, uh, what they say they're going to do. And so that's the, the paradox of our time. Uh, some of the most uh, committed anti-American alien ide ideologues are most committed to, uh, or most the beneficiaries, I should say, of, of our system and are able to express themselves precisely because of the system that they are trying to undermine and destroy and replace with something else. It is pretty unique here in the country how with freedom of speech, unlike many other countries, how you can sort of express a lot of these thoughts against American values yes. where, you know, many other places in the world, you, you can't do these sorts of things the way they're done here. So it is very interesting. And I wonder, you know, you're definitely in a space, you know, in the academic space, where a lot of this brainwashing does happen to a lot of vulnerable minds who maybe aren't looking for this sort of thing. They can be more susceptible to, to thought reform, as you put it in the book. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a few questions. What would you say you do differently beyond, uh, obviously, publishing this book? In the academic setting, what would you say you do differently from some of the professors who might be more in line with some of this brainwashing type stuff? Well, I think it has to do with how you view the, the institution that we're talking about here, higher education, the university. It's one of Western Enlightenment tradition's greatest creation. Of course, the university goes back more than a thousand years, but the university as we know it today um, is a product of the last 300 years, you know, followed the scientific revolution, following the enlightenment and I'm referring to the Western European university, which is really the only incarnation of the university that has really flowered and allowed a diversity of thought to, to blossom within, within the walls where we can discuss these, these ideas. Um, really, when we talk about diversity, people really misunderstand the current terminology and don't understand or don't, or simply not knowledgeable about the fact that this is part of the Enlightenment tradition. The idea that you have different ideas come in and they must, they must um, engage with uh, critics and they must be able to answer critics because that's you know, wrestling with these ideas. That's how you generate knowledge that is valid. This is what we learned from the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment tradition, the Enlightenment ideas permitted us, gave us that leeway to go ahead and do this. And if your ideas are found wanting, well, they are ushered to the, to the exits, very much like astrology was ushered to the exit, very much like flat earth society, a flat earth theory was ushered to the exit, phrenology ushered to the exits. They were found wanting. They were not scientifically, scientifically, scientifically based. Now, I view the university in the tradition of Max Weber, the Weberian notion of the university. Max Weber, of course, one of the founders of sociology. And he um, viewed the university as a neutral uh, site where these ideas uh, can be discussed. It's, the, it's called the value neutral classroom. And that's how my classrooms are, are operated. I, I, I welcome uh, all of these ideas. We roll out knowledge that, is, that has been proven, that is valid, and uh, other ideas can contend with, uh, with that. That's, that's what the classroom is supposed to be uh, all about. It's what the university is all about. Now, my esteemed colleagues, many of them, view the university differently. I will allow Frederick Jameson, who was a, a uh, he's still alive now. He's a prominent Marxist theorist back when I was at Duke University, and he was at Duke University during my graduate years. He said then that the purpose of the university is to train the cadres for the struggles of the future in Marxist theory. Now, this was his view of the purpose of the university, what certainly is different than the view of than my view, that Max Weber's view of the university, and many traditional liberals' view of the university. The idea that the university should be this crucible of indoctrination, 
whereby we have, we know the truth. We being those who are admitted to the, to the province and the, and the, uh, the realm of the anointed are those who have achieved what one of our philosophical, uh, my philosophical colleagues over in the philosophy department calls critical consciousness. This is a, this is a critical theory. Notions come out of critical theory, critical pedagogy, and they use it all the time. I believe that the common street vernacular for this uh, is woke. Now, this comes from uh, critical consciousness, the idea of substituting one syllable for six syllables uh, and, and saying, well, is it, this is woke ideology. Well, what they mean to say, what they are saying is that this is critical consciousness. And critical consciousness means only that you have accepted the arguments of the neo-Marxists and current critical racialists, critical theorists, um, critical race theorists, and critical pedagogues that certain theories are valid and that this is a received truth. And our job in this remolded, remodeled university is not to accept criticism of this truth, but rather to inculcate this truth into subsequent generations of students and to instruct them how to repel what they call resistance. Uh, any arguments against this critical consciousness is not is not considered argumentation. It's considered resistance to the truth. Uh, and I've experienced this myself. I mean, I've seen this kind of mentality in action. Well, who are they uh, arguing against? Who are they trying to enlighten? Those of us with false consciousness. Now, you, Mike, and, and I, have we have false consciousness. Well, it, this is one of those tautologies that is defined in terms of its opposite. What is false consciousness? Well, it means that we haven't been enlightened with critical consciousness. What's critical consciousness? It simply means that we've accepted the arguments of this particular group of doctrinaire individuals and that we no longer have false consciousness. So it's, it's kind of a circularity there that uh, kind of gives the lie to the whole, the whole slow enterprise. And so, so that's um, basically the difference that I offer uh, and that most traditional liberals offer in the college classroom. It's how you view the classroom and as, as this kind of neutral arena. And many people do not view it as a neutral arena. I have so many questions uh, based on some of what you just said, but I guess the first thing that comes to mind is uh, critical race theory is something I've heard before mm -hmm. as being perpetrated in schools. And I, I don't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the surface, it sounds like a good idea to treat others of different races with respect, which I think is how this sort of thing is presented. But on the flip side of things, I've heard many of these leftists, self-proclaimed leftists, really kind of uh, rebrand the idea of racism as instead of just discriminating against somebody because of their race, it really comes down to power. And I've even heard people go as far as saying uh, black people can't be racist because of the difference in the power structures in America. And look, I, you know, I'll say as a Puerto Rican, right? I'm a Puerto Rican. My dad is completely Puerto Rican. I had one situation happen where I can't remember the name of the movie. It was a very Puerto Rican movie. I think it was like the remake of West Side Story or something like that. Tons of Puerto Ricans in the movie. And one of these liberal people, and I don't have a problem with liberal or leftists or any of that, but uh, she had said to me and my dad that there weren't enough Puerto Ricans in the movie. And I mean, him and I were just floored because the movie was entirely Puerto Ricans. And... It like my first thought when this happened was, it, is this the result of this type of critical race thinking? I mean, she is not at all Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. We were totally fine with our portrayal in this movie. And it, I mean, maybe this is a silly example to use, but it just seems like things have gone a little weird in some way. A am I like kind of on the right track here with this sort of thing? Well, I think you're very much on the right track. And I think what you just saw was an example of of folks who are so imbued with this particular view of things that they're engaged in constantly and in, in what I've always called ethnic bean counting. Uh, they're always toting up the ethnic beans and making sure that they, that they um, match up well with some sort of internal calculus of what things should be. And of course, that 
notion of what should be is always is constantly shifting and it's really never made explicit and it always depends upon the situation and i think that uh, the fact that you identify this person as a as a white woman rather than puerto rican and here she is having the audacity to speak for the puerto rican people uh in a in a in a, in a venue uh that is catering to that particular audience and yet she feels qualified to to comment on these on these issues Going back to the very first thing you said about critical race theory, of course, this is a, uh, in its purest form, in its earliest form back in the 1990s, it, it emerged as a critical a legal theory, emerged from critical legal theories. The idea was exploring uh, racial constructs or using a, as they like to say, racial lens, uh, uh, examining the law. And some, some fruitful things you can find by applying what we can call or may call a, a particular lens. And all a lens means is that you're looking for certain facts. And this is all real, really just codified confirmation bias. Now, you know as well as I do that confirmation bias, it tells you that you're going to find exactly what you're searching for. And when you're searching for something, you're going to ignore everything else. Well, what I hear and when you hear and when anyone hears this notion, of, well, we're going to be examining, examining the curriculum with a critical racial lens already. You should cock an eyebrow and know that you're dealing with, uh, with high fraud here because what you've just heard is that we're going to be dealing with this particular issue, the curriculum, only with this particular lens, which means our confirmation bias. We're going to be looking for things that confirm our prejudice, prejudices, and once we find these things, then we can say, aha, this theory has been confirmed, rather than say, well, maybe we should use a more broad-based notion of finding various causes and effects, looking for the interactive effects, rather than looking for a preconceived notion that what we're going to find is what indeed we do find. Uh, and so that's the idea of most ideas that I've seen in this qualitative critical race theory, critical pedagogy, the modified uh, social sciences that have kind of, kind of really corrupted the social sciences that's not really research. Uh, what we find is, uh, I call this guarantor methodology, where political scientists, I'm not, not political scientists, but mainly sociologists and these critical race theory types are looking for something in particular, and they're going to find it because, you know, and, and if they don't find it, they're going to interpret the results so that it then confirms the theory. Everything that they find turns out will confirm what they uh, were looking for, going to confirm the premise on on uh, on uh, on call. Now, let's uh, see. So you mentioned um, also that folks uh, tend to embrace this kind of theory. We, we can identify these folks because they tend to utilize certain jargon. And the idea that you have recognized that they have they being, of course, the folks who are engaged in this type of uh, uh, this type of prestidigitation ledger domain of, with the word of the language, George Orwell what warned us about this where that uh, war is peace and slavery is, uh, is uh, 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 really mastery and that all the opposites become uh, the actual definition of war. Now, race has become a racism, has become a word. It was doing, they were doing this back when I was in, in graduate school. They were teaching young undergraduates that, that racism is, uh, is really not prejudice against a certain people by virtue of their race, which is exactly what it is. And uh, instead, racism is is, is uh, prejudice plus power. That's the redefinition of it. Now, no one said that this is uh, you know, acceptable. What they wanted to do was to redefine the language so that what they were accusing others of being guilty of, they could no longer be accused of this particular uh, malady, racism. That's the whole purpose of redefining something in terms of uh, prejudice plus power. They even, even if you do accept this fraudulent definition, which has become extant, I think, in a lot of university campuses, which is why whenever you say, well, what you're engaged in is racism, you're referring to someone who exempts themselves, it kind of rolls off their back because, aha, uh -huh, you obviously are not privy to the real definition of, of racism. And there is no such real definition of racism. It's, it's a, a completely a contrived mechanism that exempts the people who use it from being accused of the very thing of which they themselves are guilty. Uh, that's what's going on here. Orwell knew all about it. If you uh, if you understand how the language works with regard to propaganda, with regard to uh, the uh, the magic thinking that leads us to or leads folks to repeat certain phrases that don't re really mean anything, 
They utilize thought terminating cliches. Uh, they utilize the lingo, the jargon of really what's, what cults use when they're trying to recruit people. They're trying to get people to get them to recite the very same things that I'll give an example of what I'm talking about here. Move it from the abstract level to the specific level. Um, one of the, the worst examples of this is the accusation by, by groups that anyone who articulates an argument in a certain realm is suddenly, suddenly becomes far right. And you've seen this. You've seen this in the, the media who, who latch on to this. And here's the practical example. There's a group called Moms for Liberty, which is uh, engaged in uh, parents concerned about what their children are being taught and exposed to in, in the public school system. And this is how it began, I think about two or three years ago. And it was an amazing grassroots movement that exploded because it tapped into what people had been saying to each other. And then so suddenly they find, wow, I found that there's a lot of other people concerned about what the leftist slash critical theorists have been inserting into the curriculum at the secondary and, and uh, primary and elementary level. And um, I don't really agree with this. I want to find out, number one, there's secrecy around it. I want to find out what's going on. And number two, I want to have a say in this. And uh, suddenly we find that if the tactic, here's how it's, here's how it's uh, is utilized. A group that has been completely discredited, it's the uh, SBLC, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, which has been around a long time, was co-opted by the radical left a long time ago. Suddenly, this group of concerned mothers is, is labeled an extremist hate group by this suspect, you know, fly-by-night uh, group of radicals at the SPLC. Well, what the mainstream media then does, and a whole, whole host of uh, foot soldiers who like to repeat this sort of thing, aha, uh -huh, look over here. This Moms for Liberty has been, determined to be, has been determined to be a hate group. Who says so? Well, it's the SPLC. And so it's a kind of a contrived mechanism here. Uh, and I'm not, I won't be surprised to find it myself if I'm suddenly, uh, because I've uh, expressed rational, factual criticism of certain aspects of the university, maybe some group is going to say, ah, let's get this guy listed on one of these uh, uh, front groups that we have, the SPLC, or take your pick. And then the mainstream, even though this guy has been incited in this group, he has links to such and such and such. I, I have links to Moms for Liberty. My wife is a vice chair of uh, the Philadelphia chapter of Moms for Liberty. So I know an awful lot about this group, uh, which uh, leads me to, to and kind of a, kind of a, a chuckling or a hang versus anger at, at some of the misrepresentations I see in the mainstream media, which are mere repetitions of what the SPLC and a lot of these right, I'm sorry, left-wing front groups say about a group. And so that's, that's the tactic, to get the smear campaign out there, never to engage in the actual facts. Now, I lay out, as, as you know, Mike, I lay out a lot of facts in the book, Brutal Minds. I'm going to hold it up there again because I want it to become you know, propaganda, right? I want it to yeah. be documented in people's minds that this is the solution to a problem, and this identifies the problem not in abstract terms. It's not simply a, you know, a laundry list of outrages. No. It says who is doing what to whom, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, where they're doing it, and what we can do to help put a stop to it because it's atrocious, it's, it's a tragedy, and it can be stopped if we uh, understand the mechanism that is involved. Sure. It, it's kind of scary how many people can fall for the ad hominem attacks even as simple as calling something at a far right extremist group, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the absurdism nowadays, where even something like, and maybe you've seen this, fitness is the new thing to be attacked as being far right extremists. There have been multiple opinion pieces, which, you know, okay. can still fall under the propaganda category because most people only read the headlines anyway. Uh, so you see a headline like, uh, People who work out at home are likely to be far right extremists. And I actually looked into this article and the logic was basically can be summed up as Hitler was fascinated with working out at home and boxing and these sorts of things. So by that measure, you can compare people who are similarly interested in exercise at home to being like Hitler and a far right extremist. So. You know, clearly these types of things to the discerning eye are ridiculous and absurd, but 
you know, uh, it can be tough to see that sort of thing if you are already indoctrinated because propaganda or, you know, thought reform uh, agendas aren't exactly labeled, right? It's not going to say, hey, by the way, this is propaganda. Just be aware of that. So I guess whether you have a young, impressionable mind in the classroom or whether you have someone flipping through their social media feed or watching TV, what would you say are some of the red flags that maybe people can look out for to prevent being indoctrinated? Well, that's a very complex question. I'm going to start at the very beginning when you were talking about, you know, uh, you know good health is, is uh, extre- far right extremism, working out at home is far, far right extremism, you know, a good healthy diet, that's what, you know, uh, worrying about your weight. Well, that's a healthy, you know, li- all everything that, uh, you know, that is healthy and good for you, uh, you know, going to church, being a disciplined person. Being us, being on time, uh, being punctual, being committed—all of these things suddenly are uh, to be um, to be uh, attacked, and it's all part of the. Right. It turns out almost everyone is "quote unquote" far right. If you look at the university, I tell my colleagues that who are traditional liberals, whether you know it or not, you're now on the far right, and these are these are tradi- traditional liberals who have always you know been been uh, uh, in favor of that traditional liberal uh, a- agenda, so. The idea that you're, you know, you can attack anyone immediately as being so-called, who, no one wants to be called extremist far right. So I'm, there's a certain group of people out there who are have prepared minds and they're ready to start, you know, goose stepping along with, with the, uh, with the, whatever the left tells them to do. I should say that most totalitarian regimes, um, such as the uh, the National Socialists in Germany, the Soviet uh, Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, the North Korean Communist Party, have all been uh, uh, inclined towards training for the new person, the new regime. In fact, the Soviet Union, more so than Nazi Germany, by, simply by dint of longevity. There were entire books and theories about the new Soviet man that uh, coming out that you know, it's physically fit. This person is going to be intellectually the superior of most, uh, you know, of, of most, you know, you can prove by utilizing these socialist principles. Uh, so this idea of social engineering is not limited to this particular uh, a bogeyman that uh, the left has has, has um, generated for this particular uh, uh, exigency. Now, you ask, what are some of the red flags? Well, first of all, we have to understand. I'm not going. To, I'm not going to continue to say, you know, and talk about brainwashing and thought reform and let it just kind of hang out there, and we'll all come up with our own definition. You know, I found that there's a danger in that. A lot of people want to talk about brainwashing who really don't have an idea or grasp of what is actually going on. They think that watching a television commercial is brainwashing. They think that there's someone repeating something four times is brain. It's not. It's brainwashing has a very distinctive definition. And it is the site, you know, it is changing someone's belief system, utilizing well-known psychological manipulation and behavior modification techniques designed to change this belief system over a period of time in an intensive, purposeful program. It consists of three categories or three stages. The first stage is unfreezing the current belief system. The second stage is changing that belief system. And the third stage is refreezing the belief system so that the person doesn't backslide in the old way of thinking. Where'd this come from? 1940s, Kurt Lewin was a social psychologist at MIT, and he developed this notion of um, brainwashing. He called it, and he's the guy who coined the term, re-education. Now, you and I know that there's a, there's a long history of this word re-education, as in re-education camps. Well, this is where it came from. Kurt Lewin didn't call it brainwashing. He called it re-education, and it came from his desire to change the belief system of criminals, that you could prevent recidivism into crime by changing, by having these encounter groups. He's the father of, he's known as the father of the, mar- of the modern encounter group. He kind of developed the idea of T-groups or T-training groups. You could change a person's belief system by this process of unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. Now, the, Ch- the communist Chinese and the North Koreans, of course, in the 1950s, developed their own version of this, identical with Kurt Lewin's uh, theory. In fact, Edgar Schein, a very prominent social psychologist, wrote a book in 1961 called Coercive Persuasion, in which he established the firm link between Kurt Lewin's notion of uh, re-education and what the communist Chinese and the North Koreans were doing. Fast forward to today, 
And we find that the only place that brainwashing is actually uh, practiced in the United States on a large scale are in modern American style cults and on the college campuses. And people have said to me, you know, try to, is a kind of a comeback. I, I really, I really do not like to hear the both sides do it kind of argument when it's simply untrue. And uh, it's because it's, it's a very handy way of, of eluding, you know, evading the actual facts on the ground. Oh, you know, like when both sides do it, they're guilty of this in the classroom. No, no, I'm sorry. You are wrong. You are not in possession of the facts. The only, there's no right wing on American college campuses to speak of, of any significant numbers, any significant. And if there are, the ones you find are usually grounded in physics and chemistry and, and, and so course, mathematics, courses like that. And all they want to do is teach and research their mathematical theories. They want to research their physics. Um, on the other hand, there is a huge contingent of folks on the left and, and an equal number of folks uh, on the far left. Many of them, I say most of them are not in the faculty, but in the bureaucracies. Uh, and there's a very good reason why they're in the bureau and fill out the bureaucracies. Well, what's the ratio of the people I'm talking about here? Um, uh, Samuel Abrams, a professor at Sarah Lawrence College, did some recent research. When I say recent, I mean within the last two years, found out that the ratio on the college campuses of uh, liberal to conservative professors is six to one. About six to one. Now that seems pretty stark. Seems pretty stark. But that's the kind of thing that we've always had to deal with. I'm, of course, in the one. Um, I was still searching for the other folks that this, this ratio says exist, but I haven't found them yet um, on people on my side of the of what might be called the ideological divide. But what's most significant about this is that in the bureaucracy, the one, the folks that we all surround us and staff positions and and make all these kinds of policy decisions. They outnumber, or I should say, the ratio of liberals to conservative, radical left to right, to, to right is 12 to 1. More than twice as much, 12 to 1. And there's a very specific reason for this disparity on the campus. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get to that, to that um, question you asked me, how, you know, what are the red flags and how to avoid it? First, we have to understand what it is we're avoiding and why. And, and why we have to worry about it, because this 12 to 1 disparity is not an accident. And um, I'm going to tell you the mechanism whereby this 12 to 1 disparity in the bureaucracy, number one, how it happens, and number two, why it's important and why it overshadows what the faculty may or may not be doing in this and why the faculty are going to be the last to find out and probably the last victims of this leftist bureaucracy that I'm, I'm describing. Now, how does this, this happen? How does 12 to 1 bureaucracy occur on the campus? I've had conversations before, and, and I think we, you and I have chatted in, in the past and, and had good conversations on this. Uh, if I were to say, and, and I would say one of the main responses I get from people, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy on the campus. No, it's not a conspiracy, conspiracy on the campuses at all. And the example I like to use, if you, know, you notice that uh, you're, uh, you Money is being taken out of your paycheck. And anyway, you calculate it. It's like my daughter, when she had her first job, she was working at a library. She says, wait a minute, wait a minute. This check is not as much as it should be. And she thought well, someone was stealing money from her. And I said, oh, well, now you have, uh, she was a young liberal. And I said, now you understand that someone is paying for all these wonderful programs that you thought were free. And so that was her introduction to the idea of taxation. And so if I were to say to you, well, you know, confiscation of wealth, it's the government that's doing it. If you did not know anything beyond what I told you, you would say, oh, no, you know, Dr. Rachel, that's, that's a conspiracy. The government's not taking money. And, uh, but you don't say that. You don't say that because you're well aware of the bureaucracy called the IRS that is confiscating your wealth, a certain percentage. You know how much it is. It's reported to you every month. And at the end of the year, there's a reconciliation called your tax filing. And if you don't pay your taxes on time, the, you will become very uh, familiar with the IRS. So there's no conspiracy. You know the mechanism that generates this outcome, right? Well, most people who don't know the mechanism that generates the outcome of the 12 to 1 left to right uh, outcome on the college campuses. And that mechanism is, is three points of a triangle, okay? It comes from out of schools of education. 
schools of education are completely indoctrinated, permeated with crypto Maoist uh, education theory. It, there's, there's no debate on this. They, they're proud of it. They're, they're uh, uh, members of the pantheon of readings, of Henry Giroux and Ira Shore and Michael Apple and Paulo Freire were and are all committed Marxists. They say this. This is not a, a point of contention here. Uh, but it's not bragged about. It's not something they boast about. Well, look at all the Marxists we have in our pan. No, they don't say so, that. Some of them do. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, they, they do. There's some of our, and, then, and they say, well, that's, that's just an outlier. That's just an outlier. You know, if you look at the broad swath of, of, of education schools, and now I'm going to focus in on one small uh, facet of the education schools, which is so important. They found a way out of the Petri dish of critical theory and critical Maoism. Uh, I was, I was a crypto Maoism about 20 years ago. They said, aha, uh-huh, let's create graduate programs for bureaucrats. Let's call this student affairs. Let's call it uh, educational leadership, uh, education uh, management, higher education management. We will teach these folks, attract the right kind of people, and we'll graduate these folks, not into academia, but back into the university as bureaucrats. So suddenly we have this, now we have this answer to the 12 to 1, because they're all 100% indoctrinated with this particular ideology. And why is that important? Well, they began teaching and have been teaching their own parallel curriculum called the co-curriculum for the past 20 years. What's the co-curriculum? Well, it's a, it's a collection of fake uh, classes taught by fake faculty uh, bureaucrats, and some of them even offer a fake transcript. Uh, I know that uh, it's Rutgers University and St. John's University. They offer this fake transcript for the stuff that you have been taking, like workshops outside of classes. And this appears in your official, as part of your official transcript. And almost all of this stuff they teach is taught by, by mediocre bureaucrats. I know many of them here at my own university uh, that are simply not qualified to be teaching anyone anything, primarily because of the lack of qualification. And number two, by virtue of the ideology that they embrace. Off campus, these folks become members of the third point of the triangle. And that is these off-campus guilds or clubs called um, professional organizations called the ACPA and the NASPA, ACVA and NASPA. Um, And these are professional clubs that do what most professional organizations do, networking, publish books and articles and that kind of thing. But the most important thing that they do is, number one, they preserve that ideology. They are completely absorbed in the crypto-Maoist ideology. I should know. I'm a member of both of those organizations, joined particularly to research the point of this book. So I'm privy to a lot of the behind the scenes machinations. So, so you're an infiltrator. Uh, I'm very public about it. I've never yeah. I'm telling you, telling your audience right now on this show, you know, then that, yeah. Um, and if there's nothing to hide, well, then there's no problem with that. Um, and, and I don't lie about anyone. I, I, simply, I, I simply present what, what they say. The most important, no, the second most important, the two most important, one is that they are permeated with this ideology of decolonization and, 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 and uh, anti-racist, et cetera, et cetera. They set, they being these organizations, set the educational standards for the education schools in these graduate programs. Think about that for a second. So now you have the perfect theater system, don't you? This is the bureaucratic mechanism that I just told you about that is now revealed and what is revealed in verbal minds. It tells you who's in it, how it operates, and you've got this circle of vice of people that are training these recruits to go into the bureaucracy who then try to utilize their uh, access to students and they miss, they abuse their access to students by running this, uh, they call it milieu management, 24 seven messaging of this, of this ideology. And then they go off and they have the, they, they learn how to do this in these training institutes, these professional clubs. They offer something called the, the Institute for the Curricular Approach, whereby they train these mediocre bureaucrats how to run the workshops, how to utilize the brainwash programs, the brainwash techniques. And then, then they send them back into education schools and they set the standards the education schools. And so it's, it's a, a very much, if you know anything about Louis Althusser, the communist Marxist theorist, he had a theory of capitalism that is reproduced, capitalism reproduced on the college campuses. This is a perfect 
uh, Althusserian uh, view of bureaucracy. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant scheme if you're on their side. Uh, and what I do in this book is to reveal that, reveal that. And I, I will certainly pause because I've been speaking at length, but I will tell you what it is they actually do on the campus specifically that students should be aware of and then how, you know, those red flags you asked about, how to avoid it. So I've been a long time answering that question and I still haven't finished answering it. Have Hey, listen up. I know interruptions are annoying, but I'm not here to plug somebody else's uh, business. There's no sponsorships here at this podcast, at least not right now. So please just give me 60 seconds. Hear me out. Of course, my my podcast here is the Healthy and Awake podcast, but my business is called Red Pill Health and Wellness. And what I am all about is talking about propaganda and influence and the way that a lot of institutions and organizations like to pull our strings and get us to act in ways that we didn't exactly think of on our own. They're kind of just plugged into us from these people pulling our strings and pushing our buttons. So I do spend a lot of time talking about that, but where I am really helpful and where my business is really helpful is we teach people about these tactics so that they can prevent themselves from being influenced by others, but even more importantly, how we can leverage those same influence tactics so that we can accomplish our goals around health. And quite frankly, the same tactics go beyond health. You can use these tactics to make money and improve your life in other ways and all sorts of things. Um, so I offer a specific system within my program, the Red Pill Your Health program, so that you can keep working on your goals beyond the four-month program, or maybe you want to do one-on-one, -on -one, but I offer a specific system so that you can, without fail, implement your goals in a sustainable way, basically for the rest of your life. I offer you tools that you will always have at your disposal, tools that are personal and individualized to you and you specifically. So please check out my website. MikeVera.com is probably the easiest place to go to see my business and the program, but the official website is redpillhealthandwellness.com. MikeVera.com will just take you there. It, it's shorter. It's easier to remember. Uh, so that's it. Let's get back to the show. Well, I do have a follow-up question sure. that I think will help further elaborate on that. But I guess first, going back to the way you described re-education, right. it actually sounds like there is at least a nugget of good intention in that. And you started by saying you can reform criminals to be productive members of society. And like the way you were describing it, especially the three-step process, I'll be honest, it sounds very similar to what I do as a board certified health coach. First, we we evaluate any of the obstacles or false beliefs that might be holding them back. Then we kind of try to break through those as best as we can. Then I wouldn't say I try to indoctrinate anyone. If anything, we open up a window of opportunity for them to figure out how they might indoctrinate themselves, like what they would want to instill as their own values and their own goals. So it does sound like a type of benevolent, like assisted brainwashing, you know, they're doing most of the work and I'm there kind of guiding it along the way. So that might be a messy or maybe not relevant comparison. But my question is, do you think that those steps that you described about brainwashing or thought reform could there actually be a benevolent application to that sort of thing? Well, if you look at the Kurt Lewin, he was no, he was no um, uh, brainwasher. He was not trying to indoctrinate anyone. He was trying to fix a pathology that was prevalent in society. The idea of crime, the, the idea that criminals uh, are engaged in deviant behavior that hurts themselves, hurts their fellow human beings, everything from killing other people, assaulting other people, robbing from other people, that there is something perhaps uh, you know, mentally disturbed about the person that this particular type of therapy can address. And he never claimed that it could be, a, it could address all uh, problems that were brought to him. He said, this is something we should explore. These are the techniques that I use. Um, and, and what he said was you could take most any, any therapeutic, uh, legitimate, uh, medical procedure, and you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, 
transformed that into an evil purpose. The, the Soviet Union completely destroyed the, um, the uh, discipline of uh, psych psychiatry. Psy the Soviet government began to weaponize psychiatry against dissidents. In other words, they began to, they forced psychiatrists to, to diagnose dissidents like Andrei Sakharov um, uh, and a host of others to, th that they were crazy. And they put them that's, in mental institutions and they terrifying. put even psychological, psychiatric treatment that would adjust their belief systems. I think that that's a, that's a lot of difference between that type of thing, weaponizing a, a medical discipline, in this case, psychiatry, and using it, using it as people who happen to believe something that is antithetical to what the federal, our federal, federal government, the uh, Soviet government was saying. The Chinese have been guilty of that uh, as well. Uh, and all the way up to today, the Soviet Union, you know, went the way in 1991, 92 of, of history. The Chinese now have, have un, not relented in their procedures. If anything, they're making the procedures better and better. Now, you mentioned that, that the, it resembles the kinds of things that you do, a, a legitimate therapy to get people. You're, you're not forcing it on anyone. You're not uh, dragooning people. Say, well, you, know, you have to come to, to my therapeutic, uh, it's like, like, a, like some kind of guru from, uh, you know, and, and, you know recruiting someone into a cult. No, people have an issue and they, you have a track record, I presume, of doing really, really good things for people. And, and that's the kind of thing, you, and you, you live or, or uh, fall, stand or fall on your reputation of achieving the kinds of successes that you, you, um, that you want to achieve. Um, the idea of it being a benevolent, the idea of unfreezing, changing, and refreezing, that it, it, the technique is not, is neither benevolent nor is it, um, uh, what's the yeah. word for it? Uh, satanic. It's simply there. And it all depends upon the user and, and what they want to achieve with it. Now, if you look at, I, I'm going to, to you, you kind of mentioned that no one says this, you are going to brainwash you. Come on in. No one says that. Uh, no one says that at all. Certainly on the college campuses, it's described in a different way. And the way that it's described is that we're going to uh, look back up. We don't have the uh, advantages of a totalitarian society with regard to the Chinese, you know, what the Chinese do. So we, being you know, the folks who do this, have to be more deceptive, have to be more you know, uh, caring and sharing, at least on the, the surface, just like cults. Cults have to be really careful with how they recruit people. Um, and the American cults, especially the Unification Church, the Moonies, and develop techniques that are absolutely phenomenal in how they can identify the weak people in society who are most likely going to be receptive recruits, uh, bring them to their reception areas where they then what is called love bomb them and provide them with this unquestionable, uh, unquestioned acceptance. Everything that the, the recruit or student uh, says is funny. Everything that they're wearing, their clothes are great. If they're asked to sing, oh, it's a beautiful singing voice you have. Oh, it's wonderful. But it, every, they've never felt, the students say, I've never felt this much just loved and, and accepted in all my life. Well, that's a technique that's being used. And that technique that is used in cults is also utilized on the college campuses, especially during the period of uh, what's called orientation. And the, the folks who do this sort of thing, they're quite frank about it. I mean, I've got your quotes in my book about this, that the best time to get these students is when they're in their, when they're freshmen, when they're frightened, when they're scared, and when they're most likely to offer the least resistance to the message and so on. And they must be messaged again and again and again. That's my repetition of what they said again and again and again. And so what does it look like when some student is going to be brought into a session uh, it's like Joseph Brodsky was a uh, Soviet poet, a Russian poet. He defected to the United States back in the 70s and in 1984 gave a commencement address to Williams College. And he said, you know, you guys are formulating your, your uh, what you think is right and wrong and uh, you're trying to find your way in society. You have to understand in the great battle between good and evil, evil will never march across the doorstep, enter your abode and say, I am evil. Here I am, and I'm ready to corrupt you. I'm ready to do battle with you. No, they don't do that. No one in their right mind does this. Uh, evil is very subtle. They're very subtle about what they're doing, and they certainly do not believe that they're doing evil. That's one of the really paradoxical things about this. 
just like the new Soviet man, the books that came out on this, were trying to make, make, make and mold people, make them better than they were uh, morally, uh, physically, intellectually. That's just what they were trying to do. Now they were very corrupt in how they did it, very anti-individualistic in how they did it. And this is what's going on on the college campuses. You go into the, you being a student, go into the, uh, the orientations the first couple of weeks, you're told maybe you don't want to talk to your parents all that much because this is a difficult transition for you. So they want to remove that parental influence altogether and have that sole possession of the student's time and the student's attention. When the student is, oh, this is so wonderful. Everything's, everyone seems so accepting. All these people have smiles on their faces. They're healthy. You move in. Uh, oh, we need to go here. There. Here's the way to the dining hall. Let's go for a, ult a game of ultimate Frisbee. Karaoke night tonight. Don't be late kind of thing. And so you get this idea. You're so, oh, wow, this is fantastic. What a wonderful community. You're going to hear that word an awful lot. That's one of the words that has absolute positive valence. You know, that's the Drexel community. Drexel community. It's the Rutgers community. It's the it's community is wonderful. Well, part of that wondrous, wondrous experience is the uh, game called the Privilege Walk. You'll find this on almost every college campus, uh, the Privilege Walk. You know the word privilege is being bandied about uh, all around the country. Uh, you know, white privilege, privilege, childhood privilege, check your privilege, that kind of thing. And so it plays on this acceptance, this new acceptance of this, this uh, kind of phony word that, uh, ex that really describes a phony, a phony uh, uh, phenomenon. And so they engage students in what's called the privilege. It's a game, but it's not a game like you and I would think. It's not a game that we're going to go play in competition, play cornhole. You know, we're going to go play volleyball. No, it's a revelation game. It's an interrogation game. And so students are invited into a room. You, I provide the instruction sheet on my website. You can actually stage one yourself. Students are invited in and they hold hands, silence, and they're asked a series of questions. And with a positive answer to the question, a person who answers yes steps forward. A person who answers no steps backwards. And so the hands are broken. You see the symbolism here that all oh, our brotherhood or sisterhood is broken. Some people march forward, some people go back. And at the end of the privileged walk, you have this visual of children of privilege and children who lack privilege, right? And so that's the whole point of it. Well, what you've just done is without, without informed consent, you have just submitted to an interrogation and mm -hmm. asked questions that you would never answer on a form. But you've answered these questions. Well, it's part of a game. It's part of a game. It's, transpar it's transparency, et cetera, et cetera. This is good. And this is part of what they try to do. And they try, you know, I've got brainwash manuals that I, that I have part of my, my uh, left-wing collection of these types of activities. Um, you, Mike, could become a brainwasher and run one of these programs yourself. All you have to do is go to this book called Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice and go to chapter four and we'll tell you exactly how to run a brainwash program, starting with the kind of thing I just referred to, game to get people to uh, get used to self-disclosure, get people to you know, pr provide trust in you. And then well, you uh, just to interject real quick, I do make all of my clients stop talking to their parents and shave their heads. So I think that's, of <laughs> course, just a joke. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, maybe think about that for a second. You know, I'm, I'm chuckling here, but you know, some people out there are listening to the guy. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Uh, the idea is to cut off the ties to the past. And I think you pretty much caught on, on to that. Uh, the idea they were going to sever your contact from the past. Why? It goes back to what I talked to you about earlier, about the critical consciousness and the false consciousness. You have a group of students here who have their parents taught consciousness. Things like morality and religious upbringing, uh, you know, their, their uh, uh, investment in, in, in being on time and uh, uh, being committed to and doing hard work and excellence, those kinds of things. We're going to snap that and we're going to cut, make that break with your parents, perhaps your friends as well. And we're going to get you into a climate of self-disclosure. These are their words. I've got the thing right here. Self-disclosure and trust. And you know, the thing is, now, to the red flags, when you get in a required co-curriculum. Like it's, not, it's not being taught by a faculty member. And Lord knows who has approved this thing. 
faculty members are really unaware of what's going on with respect to this. And so that person is saying, you know what? We need to get you into a mode of self-disclosure. I'm going to model that. I'm going to disclose something about myself, which is usually something trivial. And then you are given an opportunity to disclose something about yourself. And then you're trying to get people to trust you. That word trust. Make yourselves vulnerable. That's part of the, the, uh, the uh, quasi, which is the psychotherapy vernacular of today's college campuses. Making oneself vulnerable. Hell no. You don't, no, you don't want to make yourself vulnerable. No, don't do that. I'm telling you right now, if you're a student going into college and, and the first this group of people is telling you, oh, you need to make yourself vulnerable. You need to dis disclose about your family, about your friends, about your parents, us, and, and trust us. No, don't do that. That's my, one of my red flags in brutal, brutal minds. When you see that happening, and if they're talking with you in a kind of a strange vernacular about we're going to unpack the, uh, the, ver the, the contradictions in society, we're going to help you peer into the, the relations of power and privilege. We're going to have you question your identity. Uh, when they start talking that way, you're the, you are in a, what I call a threat situation. And usually, I would say close to 100% of the time, the person saying this is not a faculty member. The person is probably some staffer off at some odd corner of the campus who has a master's in higher education, which is where they learn this sort of thing. And suddenly this person is teaching you? I don't think so. That's not what you're paying for. It's not what your parents are paying for. The high tuition cost to have some some yokel from the uh, odd side of campus to run you through a workshop that is based on what's being done in communist China. That is all not my speculation. This is what they say. They don't say communist China, of course. They say mm. Kurt Lewin. Uh, the words, you know, you'll find in this book as well, right here. This is called uh, Designing Transformative Multicultural Initiatives. There's a professor in here in the education school, of course, who believes that her sessions uh, should break down a student's sense of identity, should have the student question his or her sense of self, uh, and to establish a kind of a vertigo, which paves the way to that changing of the belief system. And let me quote to you. Now, if you, you tell, I'll leave this to your, you and your audience to determine if this is what I'm describing uh, fits the term brainwashing. Here's the quote. The process is confusing, disorienting, frightening. Students might feel out of control without known boundaries or familiar ground. They may experience strong emotion, such as anger, resentment, a sense of betrayal by those who were supposed to tell them the truth about the social world, hmm. end quote. That's the changing of the belief system. And this is the, this is the kind of emotions that they're trying to generate in students, getting students to, to, to cry tears of grief, that kind of thing. And then finally, when this new belief system has been articulated and they seem to be receiving it well, the final stage of transforming occurs. And here's what they say, quote, a new set of beliefs becomes home base for interpreting experience and creating meaning. The past is reinterpreted and reconstructed into a new frame of reference, end quote. You can find that in chapter four of this book right here, which is so popular. Uh, it has gone through four editions. I own all four editions. The latest edition came out in August of last year, 2022. Uh, the terminology will morph a bit, but the actual substance of the article remains the same. That's the brainwash on the college campuses. Uh, and when you, and I tell you, uh, the kinds of red flags that you will um, experience. And when you see and hear those red flags, uh, I tell you exactly what you can do to really put these folks on, on, on the defensive. If you don't do this, if you don't recognize the red flags, if you don't, um, you know, if you kind of say, well, what's the harm in doing this? What's going to happen? You know, your students, I mean, I'm talking to Paris now, your students going to come home angry, angry, alienated, angry at you at that first Thanksgiving break. And you're not going to know why. You're just going to kind of attribute it to a, uh, maybe a, just a general growing pains kind of thing. Oh, students just going through a phase. No, no, they're going through a phase all right, but it's an articulated phase. It is intentional. It is purposeful. And it's something that you can interdict. It's something you interdict simply by reading what's in brutal minds, being prepared for it, and then, uh, and I, if I had my druthers, I'd put a copy of Brutal Minds in the hands of every returning college student and every 
first time college student to read before they go to school and they're like, wow, it's just what, it's just what he said. It's just like what he said. I will tell you, yeah. a, a, a young mother and a family purchased a copy of, of Brutal Minds and I saw her in a hallway after she had already started reading it and she was like waving it. I mean, Dr. Richard, I want to let you know, I went on to the website for my kid's school and I looked up the stuff that I had ignored before. I looked to the section on student affairs and all of it was right there. All the red flags, everything you said was right there in front of me, stuff that I ignored before because they didn't know what they were actually saying. And now I see the subterfuge, I see the masquerade and, and my gosh, and she had already taken all, showed me, already taken all kinds of notes just for the first three chapters. And so that's the kind of reaction that I'm experiencing from Brutal Minds and I'm oh, gratified by it. And uh, I hope to uh, collect enough of these types of anecdotes for the, uh, for the next edition coming out next year. One of the interesting things I think about a lot of what you're saying, I, I think a lot of listeners might notice, is that these same tactics towards thought reform are now very commonly seen in the corporate workforce. So the Microsofts and the Googles of the world seem to employ a lot of these same tactics uh, and literal, by definition, indoctrination which is a word that many people treat as a conspiracy theory nowadays, indoctrination. But by definition, if these companies or academic institutions are going to say, look, we have this DEI doctrine that we want you to partake in, that is by definition indoctrination. It's actually one of the fears that I have about the development of board certified health coaching, because I do see not only this being pushed more and more, but I see some health coaches who are perfectly happy to limit their thinking through this lens. Um, but, you know, that's that's another thing that we can talk about for hours, I'm sure. I see that we're getting close to time here. So I did want to ask, based again, based on some of the things that you've said about Marxism and, and these types of ideologies, when I've talked to these Marxist people before. I've heard things, I've heard pushback like uh, real Marxism or real communism has never actually been tried. Um, I, I've, so I've heard that I, I've heard that multiple times, uh, usually without fail in, in conversation. I've heard that a lot of the words that I'm even using to make my points to, to try to push back against what they're saying yeah. Uh, the the words that I'm using are equivalent to physical violence. Uh, I've also heard uh, we've touched on this, like about criticizing power structures, how like I might not even be in a like it's funny because I'm a white looking person. I am Puerto Rican, but I guess I've been told I have white privilege, so I can't even criticize some of the things that they might be saying. M my question in bringing all of this up is is there any hope for these possibly indoctrinated people and if not is there any hope for future generations who hopefully have the opportunity to be aware about these indoctrination tactics so that they can protect themselves accordingly we well, have a very fine book called recovery from cults and it's a, a book that's edited by Michael Langone. And uh, there are two of the, uh, two of the pieces in that book are absolutely phenomenal. One is by Philip Zimbardo of well-known, he's the architect of the Stanford prison experiment back in yeah. the 1970s. And the other is a, a person with the last name of Stein, who was actually a member of a cult and who managed to escape and became a, a cult expert and got her PhD in, in studying these types, these types of things. And they offer a host of uh, remedies. Uh, that, you know, that goes beyond that. I have a, I have a section on my own website called DEI deprogramming. And part of the understanding of um, moving away from the cult, uh, the cult perspective is to recognize that, as you said earlier and alluded to earlier, there's really two things going on here. When people say DEI or diversity, ones who are the acolytes are hoping that you will interpret this diversity or DEI in the best possible light. Uh, as the kind of understanding that you would have, at, you know, coming out of a, a you know a, a university education, the old traditional Enlightenment education, the idea of diversity of thought, it, has, it was an Enlightenment idea, and they hope that you're thinking of it that way. 
but that's not what they mean. That's not what they mean at all. In fact, almost every one of these DEI, uh, I call them oafs, because I, I, I believe that they are doing uh, an incredible amount of harm uh, in the positions. I would expunge them from the university after giving them the opportunity of number one, transferring out of the recently closed DEI office and learning about the civic traditions of uh, the American system. And if they don't want to learn this and they want to retain their hold on this ideology, then they can find that you know, it can be invited to go work for somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, that's how bad they are. They are committing, I think they're committing a lot of, doing a lot of ill uh, with their access to students. They are exceeding the mandate for which they were hired. I'll give you an example of the type of malfeasance that I'm talking about here. If you look at, um, and the kinds of things that they, they talk about and do amongst themselves, there is a woman by the name of Lisa Spanierman, Professor Spanierman of psychology. She's at um, I always get to Arizona. I always get the two confused. I know this is really not going to be happy. They make these Arizona State and Arizona fans happy. But I confuse the two. But she's in one of these, I think it's the University of Arizona, uh, and a very prominent person uh, in uh, the microaggressions uh, field. And the fact is, in an article that she wrote and published just last, uh, last fall, she said that, you know what? You can make people feel guilty about anything. Anything. That's just the way human nature is. You, Nothing that you, you know, you, I can show you videos of, of people who are in distress. I can have you do a reading. And by the end of, say, two weeks, you're going to be feeling very guilty about this, that you should do something about this. And she said, uh huh, why don't we, she and her colleagues, why don't we mobilize this kind of ability to manipulate people into feeling guilty about the kinds of problems that we want to see addressed in certain ways and then mobilize those people to do good? For society. In other words, it's brainwashing, manipulating. I'm going to make you feel guilty about something you had nothing to do with, and then I'm going to give you something you can do to fix the problem that you had nothing to do with. And whether that problem, you know, can be solved that particular way is really never discussed. The idea is uh, that you've got to mobilize troops for that thing. The, uh, the folks that you to say to you, I, I, I thought this was put to bed a long time ago, this notion of, well, it's never really been tried before. Uh, what an absurd statement to make as if these people who are trying it are somehow less committed Marxists, less committed socialists than these folks are, less learned. Some of the most learned Marxist socialists in the world have tried this theory out and with the best possible intentions and with the power at their disposal to force people into the roles that have, they've been assigned to. I give you the Soviet Union. I give you communist China. And we have had the massacres and death by famine and by execution and by uh, concentration camps on a massive scale. But that's not Marxism. It's never really been tried that they say from the safety of their sinecures in America's universities. That's a patently absurd. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, you know, I will tell you the truth. I will tell you that the, the services of the average plumber or carpenter, I value a hundred times more than the contributions to our society than these so-called Marxists who sit in the offices and draw large paychecks uh, on the, many cases, on the public, the public dime. And so uh, what can we do about this? I think that was the basis of your question. Is there something we can do? Well, yes. What we can do is we can do it on a long-term basis and we can do it on a short-term basis. The long-term basis is we can celebrate the victories that our bold and brave uh, state legislators are doing and, and state governors are doing in Texas and, and Virginia and primarily in Florida and also in Iowa to roll back the uh, infestation of this way of looking at the university and trying to transform this university. And they are trying to transform it. That's their motto, I should say. One of the mottos of the, one of these organizations I've talked about is boldly transforming higher education. That's their motto. Uh, boldly transforming higher education to make it safe for Marx and Mao. Well, we can put a stop to that. We can do it initially by parents and students, donors, alumni, letting college presidents and the boards of trustees understand that we know what's going on on your campus right now. You need to answer some tough questions and you just let us make a choice here. If you indeed agree with what is in this book, Brutal Minds, that it is indeed going on on your campus and you think it's okay, then fine. You get kudos for transparency, but we're pulling our kids out of this school and we're going to deny you uh, uh, donations from your alumni base. Um, that's one way to, to go about doing it. Um, and the longer term, of course, is to continue to pressure 
uh, school boards at that secondary level and then pressure the um, uh, legislatures to deal with the problem at the uh, state university level system. And that will begin to cascade, I think. We're already seeing a repudiation of this grotesque ideological construct of DEI. And we're seeing people given boot uh, out of corporations. And one can think, keep our fingers crossed that uh, they're going to be given the boot out of universities uh, soon to follow. You know, when I was in college, I read a book by Dr. David Healy called Farmageddon. And I think it was just being in that vulnerable state as a college student and being receptive, whether it was influenced or not, being receptive to ideas. Uh, I read this book and it totally changed my career path because I was on a path to psychiatry and, and something like that. And it really opened my eyes to a lot of the brainwashing that takes place in medicine towards doctors who then influence their patients. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think your message and your mission and the content of your book is so important, not just for the average American, but especially for these students who many of whom are likely very vulnerable to the agendas of others. We are definitely programmable. And I really hope a lot of, of students do read this. I, I think it could really be, it, it could change the world. So for those who are listening to this, please go buy this book, please read it. And Dr. Ridgely, thank you so much. I really hope, I, I mean, I have so many more questions. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. So I, I hope we do get the chance to do this again. Uh, was there anything else that I didn't ask or that we didn't talk about that maybe you wanted to bring up before we wrap up? Well, just that I, I think that um, there is hope for um, uh, the, the restoration of higher education. I think that in, all it takes is an enlightened populace, an enlightened group of persons who are actually funding the university, whether it's through donations, whether it's through federal grants, whether it's through uh, certainly tuition tuition dollars to understand what is actually going on in the university and to I'm going to point out the university is one of those places it's a nonprofit um with you know billions of dollars in some cases at its disposal and the president of the university really fills out his own evaluation form when you think about that how are you doing president president uh, smith uh, and well, you take he 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 has a board meeting where he prepares all of the material he presents it to the board here's how I'm doing and the board says, well, you're doing a great job, President Smith. Here's a raise for you. And, and so there's really no transparency into how this operates. Well, if there is going to be something unusual going on, the board goes into executive session. So no one really knows what is going on and how things are resolved. In the business world, the numbers are kind of out there. We understand how the, you know, how the business is doing. With respect to higher education, there's an opacity there that we want to replace with transparency. Once that transparency begins to make itself known, I think that parents will begin to start to make the right decisions and students themselves will stand up and say, hey, you know what? I'm not paying for this. I'm not here for this. I'm here for something else. Definitely. Well said. Again, the book is Brutal Minds, The Dark World of Left-Wing Brainwashing in Our Universities by Dr. Stanley Ridgely. Thank you again. Where can people, uh, obviously they can probably buy the book anywhere books are found. But if people want to look more into you and your work, where should they go? Well, number one, you can buy it on Amazon. That's always a good choice. Uh, Amazon.com, Brutal Minds. Uh, you can buy it at Barnes & Noble. It should be up front. And if it's not up front, you demand that that book be placed up front when you go to Barnes & Noble. And um, it, and, and, and um, that's, that's basically it. So um, I would encourage you to uh, you know, read the book, leave a review, a positive review of the book. And um, uh, good luck and Godspeed. I hope that the book really touches some lives and makes a difference. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And folks, uh, definitely check out the book, but also stay healthy and stay awake. Okay. All thanks right, cool. So we'll end there.